Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle. And today we have with us Peggy Caruso, who is the founder of Life Coaching and Beyond. Welcome to the program, Peggy. Well, thank you for having me. Hey, so um, tell me a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and what led you to uh, found Life Coaching and Beyond. Well, I am an author and I am an eight-time entrepreneur. I've had many businesses and I got into coaching uh, mostly for the executive end of it because I am very entrepreneurial. But once I opened my business and I did personal development as well, I can see how they go hand in hand. Um, If someone comes in for a personal problem, you always have to find that balance with the career and and vice versa. So I um, ended up building a very nice facility and I realized um, a little secret that it all works hand in hand if you take mindfulness, relaxation, and then incorporate that into corporate. I have a beautiful... um, retreat center. I do leadership training, team building. So it all goes hand in hand. Yeah. It's interesting how you start off with one, um, uh, not an idea, but one uh, direction. And then you start noticing things um, about what's working and what's not. And maybe it's not even a full pivot, but it's just a a nice add on um, maybe from things you've uh, noticed or from what people have told you. So I I really like that uh, uh, retreat um, concept. Um, so tell me what were going on. What was going on when you started noticing these things? Was it more of your clients and audience um, asking for it, or was it something that you were noticing as a trend in the market? Well, I help a lot of children. So I, to to start there, um, I help them, you know, with grades and and bullying and ADD, ADHD, all those issues. But I also teach them success principles, and that's where corporate comes in because. Instilling those success principles into children makes them successful adults. And so when adults would come in and I would do corporate issues, whether it's, um, you know, work-life balance, time and stress management, or something within, you know, increasing their bottom line, it still all comes back around to family as well. So I noticed that that the two of them go hand in hand. So I, I love the diversity of what I do. Yeah, you know, there, I think there's a lot of legs to that stool, and you cannot – be out of balance because if you've got a wonderful business, um, maybe you're spending too much time there or you think you're spending time at home because you're present there, but are you really quote unquote present, you know, and you're you're thinking about work or you're distracted and you're not really at home. So I think that's a really neat correlation there. So how do people identify within themselves habits that limit them from reaching their desired outcome? Because I think the issue is if someone were to point it out uh, in your life that they would say, yes, now let's go and work on this, but you can't see the forest for the trees many times. So how do, how does someone notice within them, themselves those habits that limit them? Yes, ident- identifying those saboteurs and habits is, is very, very important. And the very first thing um, that people probably wouldn't think it would be the first thing is self-reflection. Uh, self-reflection is the first step. You have to discover what negative role that you play. Um, everyone needs to take responsibility for their negative habits, and you can't change a habit until you can identify it. So that would be the first step. And the second step is understanding the pros and cons of workplace habits. Uh, you know, you have to understand what is the con and then how do you turn that around and help it become a pro. It's just like turning negatives to positives. The other thing you know, that they I, need to... I think to, that a lot of people oh, would have a, a hard time identifying negative habits in their own lives because they're so close. Do you ever find that uh, happening in your work? Absolutely. One of the um, key things in corporate is when I have them uh, journal and keep track of their non-productive actions versus their productive. It's amazing how many time wasters we have, and that's a negative that we don't even realize. So when they say, you know, you don't have to work harder, you have to work smarter, and in less time, that's understanding those time wasters assists in that area. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And, and sometimes it's if someone says, you know, hey, tell me a joke, you can't think of one. But if you say, tell me a joke about a, you know, kid or a dog or whatever, you can like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, can, I, I remember one now. So I think when you can kind of get some of that guidance, it, it really helps you to clarify that too. So sure. I know that you speak of and teach on uh, the concept of burning the boats. Uh, I know I wrote a, a blog post a couple months back about that same concept. So what is your perspective on burning the boats? It's eliminating um, fear. People don't understand that fear isn't real. It's just something you create in your mind. But it's, um, you know, that goes to the competitive creative mindset. And people who are competitive tend to fear failure, but failure is a good thing. So when we talk about burning the boats, we talk about that fearless, um, you know, I can do this, I can win or perish. It's kind of like an example would be when I started my coaching business, we come from a small area. Everyone here said, you'll never bring coaching to a small town. But I believed in it. I believed um, because I did it. And I believed that it could really turn a business around. It could turn homes around. And I continued no matter what anyone told me. And I was successful because I built a beautiful facility and it does work. So that's the example of don't be afraid. And even if people tell you you're never going to make it, you just don't quit. If you believe in it and you can trust your intuition, you'll make it. Yeah, I, and I agree with that. But I think that some people would hear that uh, statement and think there has to be a line where you believe in it and you've burned the boat. And, and the story behind burned the boats is, you know, I think it was Cortez that, you know, came up on a, a you know, country to, to conquer and they get in their little rowboats to go and to, to get on land and he yells back says burn the boats and the point is we don't have a plan B and we better conquer this so that we now have a place to live because our boats are up in smoke and so I think a lot of entrepreneurs would look at that and think well there are certain things that I can do in my business that would qualify as burn the boats and no plan B but what if I have you know put my ladder on the wrong wall on the ladder of success and you know I might feel and have that intuition but it might be misplaced so uh, I wonder where you feel that line is where risks are fine but calculated risks are even better right and that's what I talk about when when you're being creative or if you have that you know win or perish thought um, it's being fearless not careless fearless is is calculated risks back with the desire to succeed. You have to have that burning desire because that's what's going to push you to succeed no matter what. No matter what comes your way, there's, there's a solution to every problem. There's, you can knock down any obstacle. That's why I teach a lot of things like masterminding and, you know, your resources. Who can you mastermind with so that you can solve a problem if you can't think of how to solve that problem yourself? So in corporate, you know, being a good leader means you have to be able to take risks. And I don't think people understand what it means when they, when I talked about intuition is it's that gut feeling, but you, you do small things to learn how to uh, trust your intuition. So you have to, you know, it's a process. You don't just go out and say, okay, I'm just going to burn the boats and, and not have any plan whatsoever. But it's just that, that burning desire to succeed that you back with your plan. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, calculated risks is is the point to keep in mind because when you built your facility, you probably could have had a blueprint that was 10 times the size of what you ended up with. So you made a decision to build it, but then you also made a decision to build it the size and the scope that it currently is, knowing that maybe down the road you can expand. But, you know, you could have put $30 million into a facility and said, I really feel this will work, but then, you know, no one's coming to pay the mortgage. So I think that's a, a really big piece of it is you got to take that step. And, you know, like you talked about uh, previously, fear, you know, I know you know the acronym that is really popular, you know, fall expectations that appear real because many mm -hmm. times those fears really are unfounded right I mean just like when I built my facility I, I didn't just uh, decide to do coaching and just go ahead and build this facility I started with a smaller office to test the waters and that's kind of what we do in corporate we do different things to test and see and that's how you take your calculated risks like when I built this I, I built it like you said that you could expand but also that the uh, client base that I currently have uh, could make the payments and then you add on the extra stuff like the retreat part and the relaxation part so that's that's kind of what we teach in corporate.
Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and you can buy off more than you can chew because an executive could come in with, you know, 14 new initiatives and, and really overwhelm their team. And, you know, now they're not getting anything done because it's kind of like paralysis by analysis. Right. So what do you find are some keys to uh, bringing about creativity when you're looking at leading a team? Because I think that sometimes you might the team might have the fear of not failure, but maybe the fear of, you know, their idea not being accepted or, you know, when you're thinking about creativity, you need all kinds of ideas on the board so that you can cross off, you know, most of them and then address the ones that really resonate. So where's the the keys to leading a team and fostering that creativity? Well, I believe there's many things that go along with that, but the very first one is understanding leadership because I believe that leadership is the foundation of success. Um, leadership and team building, the, the model assists with things like uh, resolving phone conflict and it fuels it with positivity, which I think is very important in the working environment. I think things like good organizational habits and motivation, um, setting goals and utilizing that those resources that we talked about previously, I think those are all very important in unlocking creativity and success in your organization. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And I know you're talking about the mastermind, which um, I'm sure you uh, have done the Napoleon Hill Think and Grow Rich reading, which you know really plays on that mastermind. Do you use any other uh, techniques that you work with your clients? You know, like goal setting, um, neuro linguistic programming, um, you know, things like that that will help them to you know put their you know dreams or their goals or their aspirations kind of into action and bring them to life. Absolutely. I think everybody needs goals. I think we need personal goals and professional goals, and that's something that I implement implement into my coaching, whether they're stay-at-home moms or whether they are the corporate person. I think that those are key. And I also think, as you mentioned, neuro-linguistics programming, a lot of people don't understand what that is. And it is um, being able to study behavioral patterns of people and then discovering how to change them. There's different techniques and things that you do to give people to do to help them. Uh, the perfect example is coping mechanisms. A lot of people don't have coping mechanisms, so that is something that we all try to identify what what is about the person and then give them the techniques that they can use that for their success. So give an example of how someone in uh, an executive space would use NLP in a coping mechanism kind of a scenario. What would that really look like for them? Well, that would depend on on the person. That's a a difficult question in the way that even when I um, did my other, my second book, a lot of people will say, well, give me an example of what you would tell someone to do this. But the techniques come because they have to be tailored to the person. What are their fears? What are their personality? If you give somebody a technique to use that is very shy and withdrawn, it wouldn't work where it might work on someone who is very outgoing. So there's hundreds and hundreds of different techniques that you can give people to use. Well, let's assume um, that someone is shy and withdrawn. Let's use that as an example then. Okay, shy and withdrawn in a, in a corporate setting? Is that what you're in talking about? In a corporate about? setting and, and you're, you're trying to help them with coping. What would a, a you, NLP technique uh, look like for them? You would, it's metaphorical. So we create, what I do in my NLP is, there are no really set techniques. We make them up. They're metaphorical. And so an example would be like if I had a, a corporate client that came to me that was, um, they did a test within the organization and he's in management, but the test come back bad because of the way that he communicated and his countenance and his body language was evident to me. So we, we did little techniques that we would do to give him that he could think of ahead of time to recognize when he was walking through the plant and putting his hands, you know, in his pockets as he walked with his shoulders down. So you give thing, people things to recognize so that they they are aware of it and then they can stop the behavior as they go. Yeah, that's really that's really a great example because I think there's a lot of times, like you mentioned, the the manager, you know, and they're practicing manage by walking around. So they think they're doing great. But then the what body language they're giving off might be a completely different message than what they're hoping to deliver. And it may be, you know, the hands in the pocket. Well, 
they might just be chilly. Um, but if you have worked with them and, the, and you tell them some things to, to do that would give that overall feeling to their, their staff that, that sees him walking around, um, maybe then that opens it up to where maybe those lines of communication are a little bit better. And, uh, yeah, it's a good tangible uh, uh, tactic. Um, so let's wrap up with a, a final question. How can a leader or an entrepreneur or an executive um, bring innovative ideas to the marketplace? And what would that process look like for them? Well, it would be putting your team together. That's where I think that the team building and the leadership things come together. Um, not quite sure I fully understand the question. Could you just repeat it again? Yeah, how do you recognize opportunities in your own market industry and niche to bring innovation to the market? Well, again, I, I would say that that would be a team building thing that you work together um, and everybody contributes a part of it. A, a leadership is the is the, the role that the person plays who is the dominant in the group, but it's a it's a, a group of well like minded people that work together and in, in a spirit of harmony. But wouldn't a leader have the initial uh, directive and then the team would kind of build that out? Because I, I feel like a, a team kind of bringing up an idea and another idea and another idea, you'd, you'd, you'd kind of run around in circles, whereas the leader needs to you know, pitch something out and say, this is the direction we're going, here's where I feel innovation in our industry may need to be, here's a project, and then now the team would want to come together and collaborate on that idea. Not that I think it goes extra ideas ways. would be bad. I think it goes both ways because when we do um, retreats for, um, like uh, we did one for a local theater group, understanding the role that each person plays and, and finding that leader who has the dominant that can take the um, ideas and then, you know, expand on them. But the leader is the person who's going to dominate the group. So sometimes the leader has the ideas and the group work together, but sometimes the group has the ideas and the leader can put a different spin on it. I've seen it go both sure. ways, and I think it's very important to recognize what the personality is of the leader and what role they play. Yeah, that's a good point. Sure. Well, um, how can people learn more about your executive or personal coaching as well as your um, retreat? My website is lifecoachingandbeyond.com, and all the information is there. Super. Well, Peggy, thank you so much for your time today. It was wonderful getting to know you. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.